Well, the door of mercy is uh, still open. Uh, it is always open, of course, and will continue to be open after the 20th of November in the metaphorical and real sense. And today's readings uh, are a strong encouragement to approach God's mercy yet again. Now, in the first reading from the book of Exodus, a very striking passage, Moses fights God on behalf of God. He, he appeals to the divine mercy. It's almost as if he's trying to sort of wrench out of the heart of God his mercy. Uh, God indeed wanted him uh, to do that for, for our sake, to encourage us in our prayer. And so it says, the Lord relented and did not bring on his people the disaster he had threatened. And then in today's gospel, just heard, any apparent divine reluctance vanishes. We have the parables of the lost sheep and the lost coin. And had we gone on and read the full version, we'd have had the famous parable of the lost son lost and found. And there is joy, it says, at the repentance of a sinner. There is joy among the angels of God. Now that really means, it's a reverential roundabout way of saying that there is joy in the heart of God himself not just among the angels, that's an overflow. And in the famous parable of the prodigal son, we have, of course, the feast at the end. We have the delight of the father in the return of his son. Now, um, go off at a tangent, which, it, which isn't a tangent at all, really. Um, but. What is the sacrament of confession, of reconciliation, really about? And I think we could say, should say indeed, it is about giving joy to the heart of God. Now, we often uh, talk about our experiences con in confession, and sometimes uh, our non-Catholic friends are rather curious about uh, what goes on there. And we may, um, you know, chat about, well, who, who we think is a good confessor, or we might say, well, I find going to confession really difficult, or uh, I like it face to face, or I can't stand it face to face, and I much prefer uh, a grill, and so on, and so on, and so on. You often hear this kind of uh, chat, and it's really all about us, um, and it's in danger of missing the point. We go to confession to give God joy. If our sins pain him, our repentance rejoices him. You know, confession is a wonderful way of turning defeat into victory, and we might say that God is even uh, grateful for us having sinned because uh, if we repent, if we, if we approach him with his grace, it gives him the opportunity to show, as he showed to Moses, who he really is, this merciful father. We might think we don't have a, a, another way, any other ways of thinking of these things really, but if we imagine God, the Father, looking out over the world, his world, and there's so much, you know, wild, crazy behavior going on, um, so much mutual harming, so much self-harming, all the rest, and he is aching to forgive us. And when therefore we turn to him 
when we, when we take the path of the psalm we sang, Psalm 50, have mercy on me, O God, in your kindness, in your compassion, blot out my offense. When we take that path and go through the door, think of his joy. We are giving joy to him. At last he is able to be God, to show his true face to us. So, say we shouldn't get too bogged down in our own feelings and complications or uh, whatever when we think about this sacrament. We, we should think of ourselves as doing something that will rejoice the heart of God. And how can we not want to do that? How can we not want to give joy to God, the joyful one? Well, let's focus just a little on the second reading. Uh, this is from the first letter of Paul to Timothy. Now, St. Paul is talking about himself. He very often does that, quite uh, famous for it. But he always does it in the light of Christ. And here he is really, uh, the re a real, not this isn't a parable, he is the real prototype prodigal son, the persecutor turned evangelist. And twice in the passage that we heard, he says, uh, mercy was shown to me. Mercy was shown to me. Now, <laughs> what he really says <laughs> is, it, there is a Greek verb, we don't have this use in English, which is simply to mercy, to mercy. So what he says is, twice, I have been mercied, I have been mercied, meaning mercy has been shown to me, but somehow it's got more of a punch. It's a pity we don't have this word, this use of the word. I have been mercied. If you type it into a computer, you'll get a squiggly red line underneath telling you you know, this is an offense against the English language. Sure. But there it is. And he says, I have been mercied in the passive voice because it is Christ, it is, it is God the Father through his son Jesus Christ who has done this. It's a divine action. So Paul is saying, I have been mercied by Christ. I have been rescued from miseria, everything that is wrong in our fallen state. And in particular, I, he says, I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, and then another word he uses, which really means I was an arrogant thug. That's, it, it's got this word, hubris in it. I thought I was God's gift to the cosmos. I thought I was God's gift to Judaism. I thought I was defending the pure faith against these Christians. And I was going round making sure they were beaten up. I was an arrogant thug. But I was mercied. I was mercied. And then he says, uh, I became, what is it, the greatest example. It's really, he's saying, I became uh, a prototype of Christ's patience towards us. The word he uses here is literally like a first sketch or like an architect's ground plan of of Christ's patience so that we, as it were, could build on this through the centuries, all the other believers who will follow Paul in, in, in faith will be able to flesh out, fill out, build up this experience. So, surely, uh, at, at the root of, of every believer, each of us, there is an experience of being rescued, perhaps 
not from things as dramatic as Saul, Paul, but still being rescued from what I have done or what indeed I might have done, what I might have become. Uh, I may be challenging enough as it is, but what I might have become if Christ had not mercied me. And we do well to remember the mercies of the Lord towards us. And to remember too, and again this is here in, in this pregnant passage of Paul, that this mercy, uh, it, it doesn't just as it were, blot out the past. It's rather like the psalm says, a pure heart create for me, O God. Put a steadfast spirit within me. This is something positive and wonderful. And Paul says, he has called me into his service. He has given me a, a diaconia. He has given me a ministry to fulfill. He has given, he gives, he gives us a responsibility he trusts and so for this too <clears throat> Paul gives thanks this is too is part of our experience of mercy which we are invited to recall and to deepen during this year and that the passage the second reading ends with what we call a doxology a little outburst of praise to the eternal king the undying, invisible, and only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul ends in praise to God for what his grace has done within him. That, that verse, that little phrase, to the eternal king, and so forth, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Occurs in the daily prayer of monks at the first day office, the day, it's a short reading given, given there to, to set us each morning on the right track that we are called to give honor and glory to the eternal king. Now, perhaps those words are a little uh, hackneyed, I don't know. Um, and every day, it is true, uh, we need Christ's patience and the patience of other people. We need this rescuing mercy uh, because we're not, none of us are unmitigated sunshine. Uh, we need this, but uh, also we are, I think this is a good thing to remember, what is, what are we here for? What are we here for? to give joy to God. Paul discovered that he could live a life that rejoiced the heart of God, gave joy to God. Well, why don't we have a shot at that? Why don't we give it a try to think of our lives in that light, to give joy to God?